Romans chapter 12, if you have your Bible. I don't know what I'm going to say after that introduction, my Lord. Uh, he's gone all Charles Stanley on me in this pulpit thing here. I've never done the table thing right here. I was looking for a mug when I got up here. But, uh, yeah, I, it, I don't get to come as much as I like to. I don't know if, how, I mean, he says that's the greatest revival, but I ain't been back since, so I don't know. It wasn't too great, was it? <laughs> but uh, I love to preach, and I got shortchanged this morning a little bit. It's one of those where you have a big singing group in, you don't really get to say much. <clears throat> I want to take, take a little time tonight if you don't care. Y'all just wave at me when you get ready to go, because I can, I can stay a long time. Um, but I was sitting there watching uh, Jennifer and Tiffany and Blake sing, and I thought, well, what a blessing it is to see kids up singing for the Lord and uh, preaching and ministering to people. Man, I tell you, some of them have to hold my mute while I shout a while, glory to God. That, that blesses my soul. Um, I never forced church on our kids. I mean, when they got to be teenagers, I didn't, you know, I made them, as long as they lived at the house, they were under pretty strict guidelines, but I, I never pushed it on them. I just, I just found out if you don't want to walk this road, you ain't got to. I mean, you, you can go the other way if you want to. We just want, I wanted to set an example of how God will bless your home, he'll bless your marriage, he'll bless your life to walk in the right way. And um, you can't make people live right. I tried that for two churches, Bill, and that, that didn't work out real good. <laughs> Boy, I was gun barrel straight and twice as empty, man. It didn't do no good. But uh, I won't, if you'll let me tonight, I want to just share something like it. This ain't profound. You know what I think we do sometimes? I, I think I do this. I overthink preaching sometimes. You know, and I think sometimes that uh, in light of being called shallow or not uh, really getting out there and diving off and coming up with a big chunk of meat, you know, or T-bone for everybody, I found out most of our people can't handle a T-bone. <clears throat> Most of them need to be spoon fed, if not bottle fed, and burped when you get done because uh, meat just shoots right over the head. Somebody told me one time, said, if you, if you preach over people's head, it don't mean you're a good preacher, it means you're a bad shot. That's a lot of truth in that, ain't there? And uh, I found out the things that have helped me through the years has not been those profound truths, Bill. And I like that stuff. I really do. It, it gives me confidence in the Word of God a lot of times to see stuff like that. But the things that have helped me has been the most basic, simple things that are the foundations of which we walk daily upon. And uh, I want to try to, to, to be um, as... helpful as I can with what I want to say tonight, and it's not profound, it's very simple, basic stuff, but man, I found out that I have to have it over and over and over again. That's why I keep coming to church, I need to hear it, and uh, I appreciate everybody coming, man, a lot of our folk, man, we had bring a friend day today at the church, and uh, it's I don't know you've, if you've been in church long or church work, and, you know, we've, we've had a little differences of opinion lately, and we've had a few folk trying to change around a little bit. And it's just like God's opened up the windows of heaven and poured us out a bucket, man. I mean, it's just this morning we got there from the first hallelujah to the last amen, man. It was just, it was just, I mean, you could just feel the power of God in there. And I hadn't felt a whole service like we felt today since I've been at that church in four, nearly four years. And uh, it's just, I feel, you know, you know this, your pastor knows this, you can just feel when you, when you start going in that right direction, David, you can just feel that God's doing something. You don't know what it is, but it's exciting. It's exciting. 
And uh, I'm just uh, I'm just real uh, thankful for what God's doing. We had we had some mean people, man. We was breaking out cheers. Appreciate Jonathan and uh, Jana coming today, uh, t today with us. And then tonight, I I was Jonathan's pastor when he was a kid. Now I ain't gonna tell you. Listen, the first time I gotta tell him this, Jonathan. The first time he ever played golf was the first time I ever played golf. So me and him bought some golf clubs and some golf balls and went out to Beckhart Country Club over in Lindale, or I guess, I don't know what that is over there. But anyway, uh, it's Lindale. And we went to that Beckhart Country Club, and we lost all our balls on the first tee box. <laughs> we was going out in the woods getting balls on the first tee box. And finally, the guy mowing the, mowing the thing, he stopped and he said, Boys, y'all ain't ever played before, have you? And I thought, what? Give that away. <laughs> we had to go find balls. We, we killed that place, man. Oh, we both could kill it. We just didn't know where it was going when it went. We're, soft, we're baseball players, man. But it was so good to have Jonathan and Jana with us today. And I love his family. His, his daddy and mom was real good to us at a former church we used to pastor, and I, I appreciate so much uh, our other church people coming. And uh, Oh, Abril, come with me tonight. Where's he at? Stand up, Abril. Get in that pew right there and give him a wave right there. That's my buddy right here. Stand up all the way up. I get them hands. Oh, he gone. He come, down, he come down to the house a while ago and run downstairs. In my, I was down in my basement in my study, and I heard something coming, and Leslie said, You got company? Here come Abram, do, 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 down my stairs. I said, come here, I want to show you something. And Jessica would give me a little picture a few Christmases ago, I think, maybe. And it's a little glass, and it's got Abram's picture. And I said, who's that? And he said, that's me. I said, that's right, that's you. I appreciate y'all, the invite. <clears throat> I was supposed to be in Alabama tonight preaching, and uh, I just didn't think I could get there. And it's a good thing I didn't, because we didn't get home until 3.30. Uh, Romans chapter 12. Did I say Romans? I'm, I'm, I'm crazy today. Very crazy. We got to the church today, had a big singing group. Their PA system blowed up. Setting up, their PA system blowed up. They hooked up to our system, and it started messing our system up. And I thought we was going to have a cappella singing. Church of Christ been proud. Boy, when we, when we got done that day. And listen... And then our videos wouldn't work. Our screens, we've been working on stuff all week. We got the place packed out. Our videos wouldn't play. Our, our PA system blowed up. Our organ went haywire. My power went off this morning at 5 o'clock. My wife was putting her ham in the oven, and she come in there and said, hey, the, uh, the power just went off. And we're trying to cook for his friend day. Everything in the world. Listen, when the devil's fighting you like that, yeah, you're doing something right. You know, if I don't run into him every now and then, I'm going to question where I'm headed. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Great verses of Scripture. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, if he says, I beseech you, therefore, I mean, it's literally to the point to where he's saying, I'm begging you. I'm begging you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, uh, uh, holy and acceptable unto God. I I, I'm begging you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies. Now, let me ask you something. you now, that's saved people. You agree? I mean, I think he's writing to save people. Then why would he say, why would he say, I beseech you, therefore, that you present your bodies? Well, it's obvious that some of them wouldn't present their bodies as a living sacrifice. And, and so, I mean, the Bible ain't real hard to figure out. You just got to think about it. If he says, I beseech you to present your bodies, brethren... Last I checked, brothers and sisters are saved people. If I, if I beseech in brethren, I'm talking to saved folks to present their body because they ain't presenting their body, which means that you can be saved, not present your body. You can be saved and not have victory in Jesus. This mic is driving me crazy. Is it on? Okay. And, and so there's they, they, some folk that, that didn't have that victory. 
I've pastored folk. Matter of fact, the majority of folk I've pastored through the years didn't have no victory in it. I mean, you think about when you come in here on Sunday morning, how many people y'all got pew jumping, hanky waving, snot slanging, shouting her out every time you come in. And that don't mean you got victory. But, but, but if you get victory, you'll feel free in it all. And so, uh, and so uh, I've pastored a lot of folk, and they just never seem like they ever got where they ought to be. I believe the key is in this, is that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. I've been preaching, and I think Paul carries this back on, on temple ground again. And, and he's saying something, uh, and tabernacle ground, uh, he's saying something along the lines that uh, you need to be a sacrifice, but you ain't got to die now. Jesus died. Come on. He don't need you to die. The, the death's already occurred. What he needs you to do is live. Right. Live, not die. I mean, you know, we, we have a tendency to think, well, I, I'll give my life for the Lord. He don't want you to do that. You may have to do that, and people have done that, but God ain't interested in you giving your life. Listen, it's a lot easier to die for the Lord than it is to live for the Lord. It'd be a lot easier to, to die for the Lord than it would be to live for the Lord. And, and so uh, I don't think he's, he's wanting us to die. It'd be a lot more beneficial, the kingdom of God, if you got up and went to work in the morning and let your light shine down at the place where you were, than it would be you get martyred out in the road tonight. God wants us to be lights in a dark world. He wants us to be witnesses. And, and so uh, uh, Paul says, uh, I beseech you that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. Be not conformed to this world, be you transformed. You know there's a tug of war there. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, he said, but thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, listen, victory's not something we do, it's something we've been given. I mean, we think we got to achieve victory, but victory's already been won. I mean, listen, it, it, he said, Thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if this thing comes off one more time, just give me a handheld. Give me a handheld. Give me a handheld.
said, man, you Baptist folk, man, y'all saved by grace, y'all live your way. No, you got the same kind I got. You can live your way you want to, because you ain't going to enjoy it. I tried it. That's how I know. I tried it. I tried that living the way I want to, and it never did work out real good for me. Now, it might work out better for you, but listen, I, I, I want to I show you from the Bible how you can have a victorious life. Now, I ain't talking about living, living sinless. I'm talking about being victorious. I'm not talking about like you ain't ever going to sin. Uh, that ain't going to happen. Because we know in 1 John chapter 1, he said, uh, he said if we say we have no sin, we make him alive. Well, John included himself in that, so if John's saved, then, then obviously he's talking about everybody else there. He's talking about saved folk, and he said, if we say we have no sin, but he said, if we confess that sin, he's faithful and just forgive us. Right. But I don't think we'll be sinless, but we can sin a whole lot less than what we do in life. Right. I think we do a lot better job than what we do. But, I mean, listen, friend, victory comes from trusting, not trusting. It's not our effort. Sometimes we think, well, I'll get victory if I, if, I, if I can just keep trying. If I can keep trying. And I think the victory, I think that's where we get sideways. I think really, David, the victory comes in trusting him, not trying. Because uh, all of our efforts uh, fall so many times on, on in, in that position and place to where it's just... Uh, it's, it's just vanity. We try, we try, we try. But we need to trust, trust, trust. Yes, I mean, listen, from faith to faith. You started in faith. You got saved by faith. But you got to keep having a faith. Oh. And you go from faith to faith. You go from saving faith to a living faith, trusting faith, walking faith, daily faith. We need faith. And we got to walk by faith, and we got to trust Him through this thing. Right. And, and listen, through the years, the study of the Bible, I mean, man, I've come to realize that some of the greatest men of God weren't immune to sin. Yeah. Even the men God used weren't immune to sin. I mean, when you get to read that, you find out nobody's immune to sin. Oh. I mean, listen, if Adam and Eve can do it, you can do it. You say, well, if it hadn't been for Adam and Eve, well, I'm going to tell you something. If it had been David and Marla in the garden, we'd be had the same story today. Amen. If it had been Blake and Tiffany in the garden, it had been the same story. If it had been Brandon and Leslie in the garden, y'all hate us too. Amen. I mean, listen, we, we're all capable of doing the same thing. We ain't immune to it. And I like as you go through the Bible, man, you see these, these great characters like Noah. And Noah does a great thing, but guess what? I mean, he don't the more get done accomplishing a great thing, and he's drunk out there naked. Right. <laughs> True. If you want to go by the law, the principle of first mention, drunkenness and nakedness go together. Right? Amen. <laughs> Listen, I was a teenager. I know what we used to do. I know what I know what we associate the the, the worldly things with. I understand that we all, we get. Listen, Noah had a great accomplishment, and guess what? And he had a great faith. That ought to warn us that any time you have a great accomplishment, you better be careful because they might be a great failure following. So why would God, listen, that's how you know the Bible's real. I wouldn't write that. You show me one Hollywood movie where the hero turns out to be a drunk in the end. That ain't what we want to see. That ain't what we want to hear. That's not the figment of our imagination. That's not how it turns out in Hallmark movies. That's not how it turns out in the in the Hollywood plots. That's not the way it is. You don't make a hero and then and then blast him at the end and just sign off on him. That's not the way it goes. That's not what we want to hear. But what we need to hear is there's a hero here and he's just like you are and he winds up falling and then we check out on him and we leave him right there. That's what we need to hear. We need to hear because our life's not built on the script of Hollywood. Our life's built on the script of this Bible right here and this Bible warns us and lets us know and God puts men like Solomon and David and Noah and a host of other men in there to show us that men at Men are just men, and they're prone to failures, and we all need victory, and we all need to go back to the basics, and we all got to get in that place where we have to trust Him in our daily walk, and when we quit trusting Him, we're going to wind up in failure every time. Every time. Boy, I wish I had a cordless mic. I'd run around this office.
auditorium right now. Hey, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll just act like I'm running. I can't run no work. I wouldn't run if somebody's after me with a chainsaw. I'm too tired of that. I might shoot them, but I ain't running. But when you get old, buy a gun, man, because you're too old, you too old to run. So you better be careful about messing with old people. I think that old man, that old man got a gun. If he can't fight no more, he can't run. So he's just going to shoot you. But listen, why do you think, thank you, sir, why do you think, eternal script. Why do you think God put that right there in the Bible? To give us encouragement. To help us when we fail. To show us, to show us that just because you failed don't mean that you're an isolated case or you've really dropped the ball. God can't use you. Listen, God chose them men knowing what they was going to do before they done it. God chose Noah knowing where that story was going to end before he ever chose him. God knew David was going to mess up before he ever messed up. Hey, listen, God told Peter, Peter, I prayed for you. Satan's desired to have you, but I prayed for you that your faith, that your faith, that your trust, that your faith fail not. Hey, listen, friend, Jesus gave us the key there to the temptation there, and that is trust him through every situation. And I believe Peter got disgruntled with the Lord and quit trusting in what the Lord said and had his own um, imagination about how that story was supposed to end up, and it wasn't going to a cross. And that's why he called Judas' friend, and he said to Peter, he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Why, Jesus is going to a cross, and nobody understood that. They didn't get it. Today's world, listen, we see Christians fall in sin and shame all the time. I have people say, well, you think, listen, this is, this is the way we do. Did you hear about old so-and-so? Yeah. You reckon he's really saved? You know what I think? With that attitude, I'm wondering if you are. Right? <laughs> I, listen, we always got these, all these Pharisees and are always Pharisees. Anytime somebody falls, reckon they saved. I mean, why, who called you to be judge and jury? If they've ever trusted Christ for their eternal salvation, they saved. And they still saved. And they're going to be a consequence to pay for it, but that don't mean they ain't saved. I mean, listen, uh, it, it happens all the time. Reckon they saved. I mean, listen... It don't mean they lost. It just shows us what the flesh is capable of. Should you not crucify daily? As Paul. Listen, if Paul had to crucify his flesh daily, if he had to die out daily, reckon what we ought to be doing two or three, four times a day, 70 times seven a day. Man, listen, if Paul had to, had a tough time with it, I, you're going to have a tough time with it. Paul said, I ain't got no confidence in my flesh. God, this is, took a wrong turn, man. We, we're, going, we're going the wrong way. I got to get going here. But listen, and you think about, you think people say stuff like that all the time. Listen, Jimmy Swaggart fell. Anybody remember watching Jimmy Swaggart preach when he was little on TV? That man scared the life out of me when I was a kid, man. How he get up sweating and slobbering and hollering at the microphone. Now, you know what Jimmy Swaggart believes? Jimmy Swaggart believes you can lose your salvation, but Bill, I don't ever remember him getting it the second time go round. <laughs> he believes you can lose your salvation, not him. He never said, well, I got re-saved. I mean, you know, where, where's that line at? A few years ago, we had a neighbor live next door to us, and uh, her family, I'm not going to call the denomination I'm Really, I'm trying to get away from stuff like that. I'm trying to, trying to get a little tax. See, I think tax what something you hang a picture on in the hallway, and I, I just ain't ever had a lot of it. And, but I, I'm not gonna call it a denomination. But her her family belonged to the denomination. They live next door to us. I, I've known the girl literally all my life, and uh, I went over and talked to her, and I invited her to church. I said, "You going to church anywhere, Monica?" And she said. Well, I used to go with my mom and daddy, she said, but 
since her, 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 her and her husband split up. She said, but since me and Mark got a divorce, my mama told me I was going straight to hell anyhow. She said, I just don't go anywhere. Her mama was, her daddy was her pastor, and her mama's the pastor's wife, and that's her family. And they told her since she got a divorce, she's going straight to hell. Well, ain't a lot of hope in that. Listen, you know what I'd like to do? Follow her mama around for a little while. I'd like to run over her mom, like I told y'all this, this morning about that woman hit me with that buggy and that scooter in Walmart. I'd like to hit her with a scooter in Walmart and see if she didn't think some bad words. See how much Jesus she got. I, listen, if I thought my dependence upon whether I made it to heaven or not was what I'd done, I'd quit right now. I'd quit right now. Hey, listen, the cardinal rule where this all things, the whole thing starts, salvation starts in realizing that you ain't good. <laughs> and you ain't never going to get saved till you realize you ain't good. And, and, and listen, I mean, until you realize you ain't good. I mean, that, that book said in Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. And he followed up in verse 23 and said, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means we don't measure up. Think, oh, think, I'm, I can be pretty good. I, I, I can hold out. I, I can endure. You, you might hang in there for a little while, but you're going to slip up, hoss. You're going you're gonna to mess up. And listen, I, if I believed that, I'd, I'd quit right now. So why do you think God wants us to live victorious lives, abundant, abundant lives? I mean, He don't need our good or godly living. I mean, we know that from the Scripture. He don't need that. But look, there's a purpose for it. I ain't saying it ain't beneficial. I'm saying there's a purpose for it. Romans 5, 6, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. You don't pay for a gift. It's a gift of God, not of works, less what? Who boast about it. You know you're boasting about it when you said, reckon they saved. That's, that's boasting about what you got, how you got it and how you keep it. You're, you're you know, strutting around the barnyard like a banny rooster. I mean, we do, we love to do that. We love it when somebody else falls. Hey, listen, you can, listen, somebody can do good. Somebody can do, listen, Blake, y'all can have 1,500 people saved here next week. And this place could be packed out, and, and listen, nobody would say anything about that. But you let him find another woman, and he better not. If you let him find another woman, man, and guess what? It'd be, it'd be nationwide news. Cedar Town Pastor falls to the lust of the flesh. And it'd spread like wildfire. It'd spread like wildfire. We love bad news. We love it. Nobody wants to spread no good news. Everybody wants to hear bad news. Did you hear about the lady one time at church? She said, if you ain't got anything good to say about somebody, let's hear it. <laughs> let's hear it. Thank God we don't have party lines anymore. Ain't y'all glad that them days are over with? Then why should I be not conformed to this world? Why should I be transformed by the renewing of our minds? Our, test, our lives are testimonies of the power of God, not to impress God. God ain't impressed with what we do. Boy, if you could drive that through people's head, God's not impressed with what you do. You know why? Because God knows how sorry you are. And if you hang around me long enough, I'll tell you how sorry you are. And when I, when I get done, you can tell me how sorry I am. And we'll both recognize our, our sorriness because, listen, I don't pray as much as I ought to. I don't study the Bible as much as I ought to. I don't witness as much as I ought to. Hey, listen, I, I could do a lot of other things for God I ought to. I mean, I'm guilty that when I get home tonight, I'd really like to lay up on the couch and watch TV, even though I ought to thank God for this day. I mean, listen, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to thank Him in the car and then lay up and watch it. I mean, you know what I do? I give God second best a lot of times, friend. Hey, you know that, listen, 
listen, it's not, it's not that I'm any different than the man I was before, but I recognize my sorriness now. I recognize my sin now. And it's not the same sin. I'm not smoking dope. I'm not drinking beer. I'm not, I'm not, it's not those sins anymore, but it's still sins in the light of a holiness of a holy God. I'm still sinning in the light of God. It's just on a different plane now. And guess what? The closer we get to God, the more sinful sin gets and the more unholy we get and the more righteous he gets the more this and the more rotten we get listen Isaiah said I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and he said woe is me for I'm undone I'm, I'm undone I'm a man of unclean lips you know, you know, you know what Isaiah been saying for the last five chapters woe unto you 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 until he saw the Lord and until he got in the glory and he said woe unto me I'm the one that's undone hey when you get to walking right honey you quit looking at what your neighbor's doing and you'll start realizing what you are doing wrong our lives are a testimony God ain't impressed by our works but he wants to use our life to be a testimony to the world that God can change you and that's why Paul said, be careful to maintain good works. It ain't for God. It's for them. The world requires you to live right. They require it. Now, if you claim to be saved, and they know you've been down at uh, Young's Grove Baptist Church all day Sunday, and you go to work tomorrow, and, and, and you cuss and tell dirty jokes and all that kind of stuff, you know what they're going to slip off? They're going to slip off the mud guy saying, I wouldn't go to that church. That guy ain't got nothing. And listen, you could be just as saved as saved could be, but you know what? They expect you to be saved, and they expect you to act saved. And see, that's why God needs it. You know what he does? They watch your life, and you know what you're doing? You're heaping coals of fire upon their head. You're a testimony that God has done it for somebody. And if he's done it for somebody, he can do it for you. It ain't no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. I wish I'd wrote that. I do. Hey, listen. Hey, listen. But I can preach it. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. I've been teaching through the book of... Uh, Galatians on Wednesday night. Not, not, I've tried to back off a little bit. Not like dissecting every word, you know, like we do, but just kind of general go through how would you approach it. If I was just a lay person in the thing, how would I look at the book? What would I see? And I ain't trying to be just, just getting crazy with it. Some of our folk are in here. But as I was looking at that, and, I, and Wednesday night we'll be talking about this, they marveled and they glorified God in me that he which once persecuted faith now preaches the faith that he used to persecute. It was a testimony. It was a testimony to the world. I mean, listen, it, and, and this is what I'm getting at. Getting saved won't take you, but just y'all just wave at me when I'm done. Uh, listen, getting saved, getting saved... No, don't do that because I'll think y'all getting into it and I'll preach a little longer. Just get up and walk you out. Easy back there, Eric. I got my eye on you. I can hit you with this microphone from here. This one that ain't got a cord on it. Hey, and I'm going to throw this little bottle of water. Listen, that's how long Eric wanted me to preach. He gave me that bottle. I said, what are y'all used to? 15-minute devotions? Man, I want a bottle of water. I come to preach. <laughs> he gave me three. Hey, listen. Uh, getting saved ain't going to take you just a few minutes. But becoming Christ-like is going to take you the rest of your life. It's going to take you the rest of your life. I mean, you, you think about this. Boy, I'm tell you something that's rough. It's rough when you read passages like, If you love me, keep my commandments. Boy. Somebody, listen, and I have people, I see people all the time. I love the Lord, I'm thinking. Well, he don't believe it and I don't either. Hey, man, I used, to have, I used to have a lady in my church, and she'd come about, one, about twice a year, three or four times a year, and every time she'd come, she'd stand up and say, Woo, I just love the Lord. And I'm thinking, lady, I don't nobody in here believe that, and God sure don't. 
I mean, listen, I, I don't believe that. You don't stand up and say, love the Lord. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I ain't real good at doing that sometimes. <laughs> David, I ain't real good at, at keeping his commandments sometimes. So preacher, you admitting that? Yeah, I'm, I'm admitting it because he knows it already and I don't care if you do or don't. I, I have a little hard time with that submission thing. You see, the, the thing about it, this is our problem with, we think sin's watching TV, wearing a shorts too short, or wearing them at all, and, and, and women in britches, and, and, and a hair too long. And we think sin's beer drinking, and uh, we shouldn't be out there with that crowd, and, and sin's not coming to church. Man, I want to tell you something, that's so far from real sin in a, in a believer's walk. That Hey, listen, all those things, I can do that stuff with my eyes closed and just, keep marching right on with all kind of stuff festered up in his heart that is, that is totally against a, a holy God. I mean, listen, friend, what you find out is all that exterior stuff ain't near the issue. All that interior stuff is. Hey, listen, that's why Paul, listen, Paul didn't say cut your hair, change your clothes, do all this kind of stuff. He said adorn yourself in modest apparel. That's the only thing he ever said about it. Adorn yourself in modest apparel. Why, Lord, have mercy, man. The, the Baptists I grew up with, that's all they preached on was TV and apparel. That's the only thing they had to preach on. Hey, listen, I'll tell you what gets me. It's that anger and that jealousy and that clamor hey listen and, and all that stuff Paul gets to going down through that wrath and, and being kind one another and forgiving one another even as God for Christ say forgive you that's the stuff I'm talking about man that's the stuff boy that really gets in here on the inside of you how you can do that exterior stuff and you can pl listen you can please the people and you can please your pastor but that still does not mean you're pleasing God it still does not mean anything God ain't going to force you to follow him. He leads you. You ain't got to. He don't drive you. I was thinking about, uh, I, was thinking, I was reading some in that book a while back, The Purpose Driven Life, and I thought God never drove nobody. The only man driven in that New Testament was a demonic possessed man. <laughs> He's the only guy that's driven. I, I don't think God drives you anywhere. Where he leads me, I will follow. But God ain't going to make you go anywhere. I mean, if you don't want to go, I don't, I don't think you got to go. I mean, listen, but, 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 but you can have victory in your life. Let me, let me give you these things. I'm, I'm not going to preach about them. I'm just going to tell you about them. You never have victory in your life until you've got assurance, full assurance of your salvation. You'll never have victory. I mean, listen, without assurance of salvation, you, you ain't going to get no victory. Without knowing you're saved from sin's penalty, how are you going to have victory over sin's power unless you know you're saved? And, and listen, without assurance, we ain't got no authority over sin. If we, if we ain't got assurance, how can I be sure do what God said to do? Do what God said to do? Or what did he say to do? Listen, Jesus said in John chapter 3, dealing with Nicodemus, he said, He that believeth not is condemned already. It's not what you do that sends you to hell. It's what you don't do. He that believeth not is condemned already. That's why Paul said in Romans 10, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. You see... It's not what we do that sends us to hell. It's what we don't do. And you ain't got assurance of salvation because you ain't done it God's way. I mean, listen, that, that Bible says in Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. No condemnation to those that are in Christ. And listen, that book said, that book said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I believe that. You see, the problem with assurance of salvation is simply we just don't believe what God says. And I can't tell you the times. I can't. Let me flip over right here just a second. Let me, let me just hammer on this just a second. Look, look in 1 John chapter 5. I wouldn't plan on doing this, but I, I just kind of got on my mind here. 1 John chapter 5. I can't tell you the people I've took right here and said this. And you know what? This is the number one problem I've dealt with through the years. I'm not sure if I'm saved. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm talking about a major problem. 
This is the big problem. Sure and say, listen, how you gonna how you gonna walk for the Lord if you ain't sure you say? Number two, how you gonna help somebody else walk for the Lord if you ain't sure you say? I mean, you're a miserable case if you ain't sure you say. And I've took people right here so many times. Verse number nine, it says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his son. You know what, you know what he's saying right there? He's saying, you know what, we'll believe something if somebody else says it, but if God says it, we don't believe it. Now, you think about this right here. If, if, if we're sitting here huddled up and somebody said, you seen the weather tonight? You seen the weather? Jennifer, you heard the weather tonight? You, did you hear it's going to snow tomorrow? Lord, have mercy. We better go by and get some milk and bread, you know, and, and everything. It's going to snow tomorrow. And listen. We turn on TV, and sure enough, the weatherman says, oh, we're expecting six inches of snow tomorrow. Man, you won't bat an eye. You won't bat an eye. Hey, we're getting snow tomorrow, man. We better go get some snow. We better get prepared. We don't even think about it. You know why? Because we received the witness of men. And you know what? That joker, 50% of the time ain't right. You know what I'd do if I was a weatherman? 50% chance of clouds, 50% chance of rain today. You never, listen, it's always right, man. You can be, well, I told you it's 50% chance it could rain, you know, today. And nobody would hate you then. But it wouldn't be the truth. But, hey, nobody would be mad at you. But, you, listen, the weatherman can tell you something, and you won't bat an eye what he tells you. Well, it's going to be cold tonight. We better get some more wood in here. And never think, listen, we don't even question it. You know why? we got faith in the weatherman. But God can tell you something. You're like, well, now, I don't know. See how we do that? Well, I know that's what it says. No, it says 100% chance of snow right there. You just don't believe God's forecast. It says 100% chance of hell if you don't do this. <laughs> there we go. I, I just thought of a good message, man. 100% chance. I'm going to give you the forecast. You going to give you the forecast? 100% chance of hell. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. 100% chance of it. You know why? It's right there in the Bible. If you don't believe God, you made God to be a liar. God said he'd save you if you'd trust his son. If you don't believe that, you made God a liar. You're making God out to be a liar. Look what he says here. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. I've carried so many people right here and said, look. He said, and this is the record in verse 11. God hath given God hath given, hath given. I know that's old English, but let me give you a little English lesson. That's already happened. It hath been given. God hath given us. Look at it. God hath given us. God hath given us, us, eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Now, if you've got a problem with assurance of salvation, it's because you, you're making God a liar. You, do you believe what he says? That's what he says. Do you believe it? You either believe it or you don't believe it. Well, I know I believe it that way, but this is what I run into. But now, now Granny and them, Mom and them, they, they always said, you know, that, that there's what you need to ditch. Hey, I'd rather take a greenhorn that ain't ever been nowhere and train them up so I had to get all that other junk out of their life. You know why? Because it took a long time to get that junk out of me. Long time to get that junk out of me. Now, you either believe what he says or you don't if you want to have assurance. Bottom line. I'm not talking about believing in God. I mean, these, these people does that all the time. They believe in, the devils believe in God. But I'm talking about believing God. See, we can believe in a, in a spiritual being up there somewhere. I believe there's a God somewhere. But I ain't talking about just believing there's a God up there. I'm talking about believing God, believing what he said, believing that his word is true, trusting what he said. Salvation is trusting what God said, his testimony, his record of his son. And when we trust his son, he gives us eternal life. You know, you, you know what you have to do to trust his son? Quit trusting yourself. And religion, man. And after you get saved, listen. After you get saved, you ought to start growing. You ought to start growing. Now listen, we got a bunch of little babies around here. I remember April, he, he was just a tyke, man. 
little Abram there. We got a bunch of little babies around there. Y'all fixing to have one right here? Now, when Judah gets born, and Blake called him Judas last night. And, and I told him I was going to preach on Judas tonight. He said, that's your grandson. I said, I thought it's Judah. Judah. Now, what I'm persuaded to believe, if he takes after me and Rodney, he's going to be a Judah. If he takes after me and Leslie, he's going to be a Judas. So we'll just have to see when it's all said and done. But, but look here. What if Judah, what if we come back? He's going to be born in a few weeks. And guess what? Well, if we come back here in a couple of years and old Judas still in his diaper, still sucking his passy, still, and listen, what if three or four years roll by, he's still in his little pumpkin seat, he's still in his little newborn diaper. He's there, you say, something wrong with that baby. Yeah, there's something wrong with that baby because you know what it's natural for a baby to do? Be hungry and eat. If you get saved, you know what you're going to do? You're going to get hungry. You're going to get hungry, and you're going to eat. You're just going to do it. I want to tell you something, man. We got a few people around our church about preach me to death. Y'all know who they are. We, we got a few that's just, I mean, they just come in. They're green as gourds, man. They didn't know nothing. And they, they just got fired up, started asking questions. And, man, I'm telling you what, man, it, I love seeing people get that way. Why? Because as newborn babes, we desire the sin seal miracle of the Word, Peter said. So we've got to desire that milk. And you know what the Word of God does? It'll give us strength. Bible study and Sunday school and revivals and Bible reading, not just Bible reading, studying that thing. And, and listen, and church services and CDs and, and radio and TV. Me and Bill, Bill gives me CDs. I give Bill Crumley CDs. Man, we're CD listeners. I got a bunch of CDs. Blake gave me some CDs the other day. I got some other CDs in my car. I, listen, I got me an unlimited uh, a, a host of preachers from Sermon Audio. I, I listen to all kinds of preachers. I listen to wild preachers, crazy preachers, slobbering preachers. I listen to refined preachers, I listen to educated preachers, I listen to dumb preachers just so I know what not to say, amen? I mean, you need to listen to a dumb preacher every now and then. I mean, just a nut job say, man, I don't want to ever say that again. That sounded stupid. I mean, it'll help you like it. All preaching's good for you. Some of it will tell you what, what to say and some of it will tell you what to say. It's all good for you. And the more Bible you pour in, the stronger you're going to get, you know? I mean, listen, I, I, say, I said something about Popeye at church the other day and the kids are like, Popeye? Y'all don't know who Popeye is. I mean, listen, you know, listen, if you're old enough, studying the Word of God and getting in a good study and getting in a good time and spending some quiet time with the Lord, you know what that is to a Christian? It's like Popeye spinach, amen? I mean, boy, I mean, boy, you get that, boom, pow, you ready to take on old Brutus, amen? And any, any of his buddies, anybody, you know, it just gives you some fire, man. And I like it. Man, we just recently started some small groups at our church. And Abigail's in one of the small groups that was up at our house the other night. My wife takes the, what do y'all call that? Like college age? College, college career age? And there's about, I don't know, 10 of them girls up at the house. And I, I, be, I was over in Gadsden, Alabama. I told, I, I said, you know, I'm gonna work late, and I'll just come in late. And so that thing started at seven o'clock, and I got home at nine. And they still there, so I just ease on through, take me a share, get out of the share. I'm hungry, man. It's about ten o'clock now. They still in there. And some of them girls stayed at our house till eleven o'clock, and I said, I, y'all got to go. I'm glad y'all fired up, but the revival's over for the night. There's got to be a time limit on this thing. But thank God somebody's getting enthused about it. I mean, listen, you, you, see, you start seeing that growth and that desire and that hunger and that thing. And you know what you know? You know, is that time right on that clock thing back there? You know that they're, they're getting what they need because Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Why do you get transformed? Well, he told you right there, didn't he? I, I done flipped from that. I, I know how you got transformed. You got transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
the renewing your mind. Listen, you, you think about this. Changed. Renewing your mind. Transformed. And, and listen, how? The renewing of your mind? You know what the Word of God does? The Word of God takes out our bad thoughts and puts in good thoughts. And guess what happens? It changes the way we think about stuff. And so all of a sudden, we always had these ideas. And that Daddy always said, and Papa always said, and Mama always said. And, you know, and, and listen, you know, it was talking about this other day, like uh, putting uh, brute and snuff on a bee sting. Oh, yeah, Mama always said he'd draw the poison right out. Yeah, it's nasty, though. It's nasty. Brown, brooding snuff running down your leg, just tough it out. I don't care if it takes it out or not. And some of y'all swear by it. I guarantee you do. It may do it, but you need to get renewed in your mind. They make stuff today that's not as nasty as brooding snuff to put on bee stings. You say, we poor, we'll take up a love offering for you just so you don't terrorize them kids. I remember, y'all remember that terror? I do. Come here. You know, I, hey, mama. Hey, listen, you're traumatized because brooding snuff's running down your leg. It ain't got nothing to do with a bee sting anymore. It don't make it better. You're just traumatized because you got brown junk that come out of your mama's mouth running down your leg now. And so now you're traumatized from that gross stuff. You forget about the bee sting. I'm talking about getting rid of all that crazy junk and get your mind renewed. Forget about all that stuff. You know what happens? The more you put it in, listen, the Word of God changes our thinking from what the world thinks to what God thinks. And listen, that's why he said, let this mind be in you which was in Christ. And all of a sudden we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Listen, I believe right living is linked directly to right thinking and right believing. What was it, James Guy, or was it Warren Wiersbe that said, doctrine determines behavior. What we believe determines how we behave. I think that's the way you believe. And if we believe right, we'll behave right. We'll behave right. Well, I'm done. I mean, I'm not. We, we, we just got started. With, that's like two points of ten, but I'm done. Hey, listen, I want to encourage you tonight. Get in church as much as you possibly can. Get in church as much as you possibly can. And I want to tell you something. Pray. Pray. And you say, well, I don't even know how to pray. Well, you know how to talk, don't you? Just pray. I mean, listen, I want to tell you something. Prayer will do something for you. Prayer will do something for you. And listen, it, it might not change your situation. It might change you about your situation. I told him this morning, man, our prayer went out. Listen, honest to God, our prayer went out this morning, and my wife come in there, she got up at 5. I didn't go to bed till nearly 3. And she got up at 5, and kind of, I just tried to snooze right on. She come in there, hey, our prayer's off. Like, I can do something about it. I can't do nothing about it. Why, you don't see no hard hat on this head. I mean, it's a hard head, but it ain't no hard hat. I ain't got no bucket truck. I can't go out there and get on a treadmill and bum up some electricity. I couldn't do nothing about it, so she had to come in there and drive me crazy. I said, Lord, wife's got that ham. She's driving me crazy. I'd like to sleep for another hour, hour and a half or something before I got to get up. Would you please turn the power back on? Boom. Honest to God, like somebody flipped a switch up in glory, Boom, okay. Well, I perked up a little bit. I thought, glory to God. I'm telling you, man, that's the way it works right there. You get a parent, you're like, yeah, that's like, glory to God. That ain't happened in 10 years, man. It just happened today. I said, thank you, Jesus. I told my church, we was going to go down to the Coosa River. I was going to part it this afternoon. Y'all just come with me. I'm, I'm up there with Moses now. That's what I told him. I felt strong in the Lord. The power of his might. Hey, listen. Praying, praying will, it may not fix your situation, but it'll fix you for your situation. It'll fix you for your situation. And you know what? All that stuff, listen. If, if you'll just start putting forth that effort, 
trusting Him and following Him. Just following Him. It's not what we do necessarily. It's, it's what we believe and how we, our lives are changed, transformed by what we believe. And all of a sudden, we'll realize we're starting to get free. Did you know that when Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves in the, what's that called, the Emancipation Proclamation, was it called? And did you know that a lot of them never left? And a lot of them was never told and they never understood. And they were free and they didn't know they were free. And I'm thinking, ain't that the way Christians are? We're free a lot of times. We don't even realize we're free. We're free in Christ. And boy, I'm telling you, we're studying Galatians. Thank God. That's why I want to title that thing. Thank God. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, free at last. Because Christ has set us free from sin and death.